we've been, what God has placed in my heart um, just this last month or so is just reading from the, the Psalms of Ascent. And it's a group of Psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And I've just been really meditating on that because I feel and, and I know God is calling us to step out of what we see with our eyes, to step out of what we hear with our physical ears, and to really step into what we're seeing in the spiritual, what we're hearing in the spirit, in the spiritual kingdom. And part of that process really is the call for the church to come and worship and to praise. And God is shaking things up. God is making things new. And never before in, in, in time has the church been more necessary and more required. But part of that requirement is that we, the church, become who God called us to be. With, with, with um, again, I'm forgetting the word, but, but to become that with, without letting go of who we're supposed to be. To, to become the fullness of who we're called to be. So this is a message of grace and truth. Someone say amen. Because you can't have grace without truth. And you can't have truth without grace. Grace, really, if preached without truth, becomes a license. And truth, if preached without grace, becomes a baton. So some of you might feel really convicted this morning. Some of you might feel affirmed and encouraged. But I want you to remember it's, it's grace and truth. See, God's calling us to set the standard. And we can't set the standard if we don't actually live like the standard that He's called us to be. I'm so aware of how broken our world is. And we can't have a broken church just saying, oh, well, I'm broken. Because then the world's not going to see righteousness. It's not going to see the kingdom. We are righteous people. We are wise because of His Spirit. And the Bible says those who are wise will lead many to righteousness. If you're in this church, it's because you want to become all that God has created you to be. And nothing less than that. So Psalms 133 says, Behold, behold, just behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. These songs of ascent were apparently sung as the Israelites came up to worship God. It's one of the theories. God just spoke to me and said, these are songs of ascending. These are songs of us stepping out of the miry clay up into the kingdom. Songs of us awakening to God's principle. Song of us wakening up to all that is available in His presence. And it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold, have a look, see how good it is. Look at how amazing it is when brethren can be in unity. When the church is in unity. The brethren refers to you and me. Look at the person next to you say, Hey brethren. <laughs> Afrikaans church had a tradition of saying, Hey, brother. Hey, sister. <laughs> In this church, I'm Dan the man. You can call me that. <laughs> brethren. You're all brethren. Brethren in unity 
it's not necessarily, although that's a big part of it, in unity there's this temptation to try and agree about everything, right? It's like we've got to find things to agree about. And when we agree, there's, there's unity. No, agreement is a fruit that comes out of unity. You can't agree to be in unity. When you're in unity, you will agree. Okay? You can't agree to be in unity. When you're in unity, you will agree. Agreement is a fruit that flows out of being in unity. Does that take a lot of stress for some people in the, in the room? Okay, we, we've got to agree as a body. We've got to be in unity as a body. And then you go home and, and, and you and your wife can't be in unity. You're not in unity because you're striving to agree. All right, so we're going to talk about you and your wife get home. We're going to talk about point A, B, and C, or, or with anyone. <laughs> How many of you have arranged a meeting and then that meeting didn't go as planned? Because you needed partner A, needed partner B to agree. And partner B was like, I ain't agreeing. No ways. Not a chance. And now we're scrambling for unity. No, unity is a spiritual thing. Unity is what comes when God's presence works through you. And you come to the table and you realize, wow, there's agreement. Because we've drawn from the same place. We wanted to name our second child. How many of you have named a child before? Child number two, he was a tough one. We watched movies to watch all the names. I like Matt, Damon. <laughs> Put them together and you got a new name. <laughs> God promised us we'll have an Ethan. So now... This is before we had children. So now child two is in the womb, and we're like, it's a boy, so it must be Ethan. Doesn't want to sit. Doesn't, doesn't want to gel. Doesn't want to, doesn't want to just, it's like, I pluck me. It's like, One day we come to the kitchen table. Bernadine says, I have a name. I say, me too. And I say, Michael. And she says, she fell off her chair. She says, you can't believe it. I have the same name. Drawn from the same source. Unity. Not, okay, we're going to fight about this name and then we're going to arm wrestle and then ching chong cha and agreement. Now we're in unity. No, agreement comes, it flows out of unity because you're drawing from the same source. That's why it's so important, church, that we're drawing from the same source. It's so important, church, that we're drawing from the Holy Spirit and we're genuinely going to the Holy Spirit for His input because when we do that, we're going to find we're in the same place. Wow, that's what confirmation is. Wow, wow, it's so fun. It's actually fun when we get together as a, as a body and we're like, what, you two? No ways. Benedine, you want to say something? So last week, here we are. <laughs> last week we were in Kimberley. This lady, random comes to me after the sermon. How many of you were here last week? Put your hand up. Okay, then you'll get it. Uh, she comes to me afterwards with a little bottle of honey. And she says, I feel like I need to give you honey. 
Meanwhile, mom is speaking here with this amazing uh, prophetic action afterwards, left honey for everyone there on the counter for honey yeah. to, take, to take part in the honey. And she, there in Kimberley, yeah. drawing from the same spirit, says, I feel like I need to give you honey. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9 says, for our knowledge is fragmentary. Our knowledge is fragmentary. Paul was obviously typing on a computer with Windows 95. And back in those days, they didn't have solid state hard drives. So Paul's writing on his computer and this little message pops up, you need to defragment your disk. Anyone remember that? Anyone old enough in the room to have worked on a Windows 95 computer? And then it's stuck for like a month. <laughs> while it defragments. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, your hard drive, well, Paul's hard drive, had layers of disks. And then when you get a new computer, it starts writing on the first disk, but it doesn't have enough space on the first disk, so it needs to write on all of the disks. And then it's full, and then you delete something. And in those days, if you deleted one movie, you got your whole hard drive back. If you deleted a song, you got like a quarter of your hard drive back but it was never in the same physical place on the disk. So your hard drive had to store things on different places, even on different disks. So if you want to open up one song, it has to fetch all of that information from multiple locations and do it in real time, which is why your computer would hang. So we are, are fragmented. Every one of us has a different experience of God. Every one of us has a different memory. Growing up, we grew up in different ways, in different households, with different experiences, different churches, different failures, different successes. Yet there's one Holy Spirit that speaks to every single person. So you get a fragmented knowledge you get a fragmentary piece of information. Not only that, we, we have a God who created billions and billions and billions of galaxies within a universe. And we sit here on earth and we like, we see a very small part of a very, very big God. On top of that, He only gave us this which is a very small, very, very small glimpse of who God is. A very fragmented, tiny glimpse into the greatness of God. Yet God said, this is all you need to reach your full capacity. This isn't God's full capacity. This is our full capacity. Does that make sense? The Word is given to us to equip us. The Word is given to us to encourage us, to perfect us. But it's not, it's not all of God. God has only revealed to man what He wants to reveal to man. So our knowledge is fragmented. Our knowledge is really small. It means no one can genuinely say with confidence, because I know this, God must be. What He has invited us to is a constant relying on His Spirit. A constant pressing into His presence. 
You can read the Word without the Spirit, and you'll have nothing. Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus told the Pharisees, you know the Scriptures inside out, and you've never found life because you don't know me. So even the most learned theologians, if they haven't learned with the Spirit, they know nothing about life. Because this is a very small black and white glimpse into a very big and powerful God. But this is what He gave me. The fullness of Scripture. Applied in my life through the Holy Spirit. And each and every person in this room has a different experience of God and the Word. And yet he says how good it is when the brethren are in unity. See, the beginning of reverence, the beginning of unity is reverence. The beginning of unity is awe. It is being absolutely in awe of God and his presence, of who he is and how his spirit comes and works in us and through us. I want to speak about unity in two contexts, contexts today. I want to speak about unity with, as if it has two legs. It's got more than two legs. But I want to speak about two outflows of unity. The first outflow of unity, or the first enabler of unity, or, or the, the first way that we as a body can be, the brethren can be in unity, is through commitment to the body. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about faith, hope, and love. I want to apply faith, the faith part, to the commitment part. Faith is the conviction and the belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Conviction leads to commitment. Commitment. Conviction leads to commitment, respect, and honor. It's, a, it's being in awe of our relationship with God. But being so in awe with our our relationship with God that we're committed in our relationship with God. And we're committed as a bride in our relationship to God. Psalms 133 in verse 2, it says, Unity is like the precious ointment poured on the head that ran down on the beard, even the beard of Aaron, the first high priest. It came down upon the collar and the skirts of his garments, consecrating his whole body. And then there's a reference to Exodus 30, verse 25 and 30. And I went there, and I want to read that to you. Exodus 30, verse 25 to 32. Unity is like oil, says Psalms 133. Exodus 33, am I right in the right place? Exodus 30, sorry, Psalm 133, Exodus 30. Verse 25 says, And you shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume compounded after the art of the perfumer, and it will be a sacred anointing oil. God's saying, you shall make unity, because Psalms 133 says unity is like the oil. So you shall make unity like an oil with a beautiful presence. Come on, behold how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren are in unity. Come on, you will make the oil according to the art of the perfumer. And you shall anoint the tent of meeting with it. 
you shall make unity beautiful and you'll anoint this house, this church with it. Are you processing Windows 95? Come on, I just want you to see the picture. You shall make unity like a beautiful perfume and you will anoint this house with it, this building of meeting, this gathering, this congregation with it. Verse 31, and say to the Israelites, this is a holy anointing oil, sacred to me, alone to me alone throughout your generations. It shall not be poured out upon a lame man's body, nor shall you make any other like it. It is holy, and you will hold it sacred. God spoke to me with that verse about the need for commitment in the body. It says you won't pour out that oil of unity on the layman. The layman in, in this reference, what I got out of it was the person who is not committed to the church. See, sometimes we spend our time arguing and trying to be in agreement with people who aren't even committed to the bride. God's saying, don't pour that oil out where it's going to be wasted. Don't pour that oil out where it's going to frustrate you, where it's going to, where it's going to like Justin spoke, the, the, the fly in the ointment, the fly in the oil, where it's going to contaminate that which is holy and that which is very, 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 very sacred. In our church, two things are very sacred. One of them is the marriage between a man and a woman. It is sacred. It is holy. There is nothing in a relationship terms that is as holy in relationship than the marriage between man and woman. Submitted in the spirit. Submitted in the presence of God. Nothing is more sacred. No relationship is more sacred and more holy. And God uses that relationship as a picture for the relationship that we have as the brethren. The brethren committed become the bride. Because a bride can't be a bride until she said yes. And there is a commitment there is a commitment to loving as a body, to the phileo love of God. The phileo love is the special love that is reserved for brethren. For man to love a man in a good friendship, woman to love a woman in a good friendship, in a healthy body, in a healthy congregation, but it requires a commitment to the bride. That's one of the legs that unity stands on, is commitment. I wrote this down here. I said, you can't date the church. You cannot date the church because then there's no commitment in unity. God never sanctified dating relationships. He never sanctified living together as if married. It's never okay. It's never good. It will never result in life. It will never result in the fullness that God has called us to. What He did sanctify is the marriage between man and woman. The beginning of unity. Now remember, I am I'm speaking in grace and in truth because I know that in grace God can take any person and bring them back to their inheritance. But what it needs is for that person to say, God, will you work in me? Will you renew me completely? 
I give you every part. I give you all of my mistakes. I give you all of my failures. I bring them out into the open. And then God says, come, I'm going to bring you to a place where you can now live in what is sanctified and what is holy and in what is true. The only sanctified relationship is one that can stand on commitment. Otherwise, it's not sanctified. Otherwise, it's not holy. God says, don't give that oil to the layman. The one who's just here for the butter and the cream, but is not going to walk the whole journey. It's not going to go the whole way. Our nation is not going to be transformed if the church is not first transformed. If the church doesn't become committed to God's call on our lives. And it's a lifetime commitment. And sometimes it will cost us, even when we don't want it to cost us. In Acts 15 verse 26, the council of churches sent Paul and Barnabas. And with Paul and Barnabas, they sent men. And they wrote of those men. They said, we're sending men who have hazarded their life for the sake of Jesus Christ. They didn't write that lightly. This is, this is you know, I, I spoke about Peter being released on prison, remember, that, out of prison, remember that two, three weeks ago, where it was as if in a dream. Peter's worshiping, and an angel comes and opens the gates for him, and he walks out onto the streets, and he's, what, I, what, what is actually happening there is, is that was just after James had been murdered. He had been killed for the gospel. Then Peter's in prison and he's worshipping. Paul and Barnabas go on a first missions trip and they get dragged out of the city and stoned. And the people thought they actually killed them. They were left for dead. And somehow a week later they're back on the missions field. Somehow they're back doing what God called them to do. See, what I struggle with is the Bible gives us an example of men who hazarded their life, and then on this side, we've got people who just can't commit. God's calling us to give our lives for a purpose. Come on, men, our, our children, when we come home in the afternoons, ladies as well, I mean, ladies are working just like men. Our children are coming home, and... and they're looking for our attention, and sometimes we've got to lay down what we're busy with so that we can pour love into them, so that we can spend quality time with them. We've got to say, I'm, I'm, that stuff doesn't matter for now. Um, Marius was telling me about James Dobson's testimony, of how James Dobson's father would go out on the mission field for, for six weeks or months at a time, and one day as he became a young teenager with a little bit more brains and attitude, he argued with his mom and he stepped over the line. He took authority for his life. And he heard his mom in the room phoning the dad saying, I need you. And on that phone call, his dad gave up the mission trip to be home, to be where he was called to be with his son. In that moment. So sometimes God is calling us to lay our life on the line for a certain promise, for a certain calling. And we've got to be aware what that means and when it is. We can't make excuses about it. We've got to, come on, this is truth. This is truth, right? One of the ways we really are in honor. The second way, the other leg in union is honor. Sorry, let me just rephrase that sentence. The second leg of unity is honor. And the reason for that is because we are fragmented. We are different people. And we've got to learn to honor those we are in the body with. We've got to learn to honor what they carry. Honor their experience of the Holy Spirit. Honor who God has called them to be. 
Romans 12 speaks about gifts. Speaks about different callings, different anointings. The end of the matter is, is that Paul writes, he says, it doesn't matter whether your gift is great or small, God honors the smallest gift. Why? Because it's a gift activated in the Spirit. It's a gift that is submitted in the Spirit. And God gives great honor to every person because they are living in their gift. You don't have to try and be like the person next to you. You can, you can turn to the person next to you and say, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> Come on, I see some husbands and wives are like, <laughs> just say it with boldness, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> now say, I don't want you to be like me either. <laughs> See, when we don't honor the calling in someone else's lives, we, we try and want them to be like us. We're like, yeah, man, if this guy just had my brains, come on. It's like... <laughs> God's never called anyone to be like the person next to them. I believe so many marital problems are solved in an instant when we realize, wow, I don't want my wife to be like me. I don't want my husband to be like me. I don't want my friend to be like me. I don't want my boss or my employee to be like me. I want them to be the best that they can be, who, who God created them to be. I want to honor them for that, and I want to honor the spirit at work in them. Romans 13, 18 says, 1 Corinthians 13. There is no 18. What, what is going on here? It's fragmented. Loading. Hold on. It was 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But God has placed and arranged the limbs and the organs in, and each particular one of them, just as He wished and saw fit, and with the best adaptation. My mom's like, that's the latest model. <laughs> latest upgrade. God has, it's not Windows, it's Apple. God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as He wished, just as He wished, and as He saw fit, and with the best adaptation. Meaning, you've been adapted for this time. You've been adapted for this moment. There never has existed a moment that's required you for this time and this place. But you've got to be in the Spirit. You've got to be drawing on the Spirit. You've got to be drawing from the Holy Spirit. Because otherwise that you doesn't become alive, doesn't fit into place. So many people struggle with purpose because they're not walking in the Spirit. Can I say that again? So many people struggle with purpose because they're not walking in the Spirit. Verse 24. I hope it's the right 24. God has so adjusted the whole body, giving the greater honor and the richer endowment to the inferior, which lack apparent importance. So many people are looking for recognition in the body. And they think, if I can only be in that place that looks important. 
then I'll have something, then I'll be someone of worth. And God says, that's not how I work, that's not how I operate. All I'm asking you to do is to listen to my voice, to get excited about what I place on your heart, and to live with, with passion. If you've ever been a volunteer and, and you've and you've had a discussion about me about being a volunteer in the church or getting involved, you'll know I'll ask, what is it that God's placed on your heart? What is your passion? Because I know that's where you're most going to come alive in the body. I know that's where you're most going to be full of passion and full of zeal because God has created you and adapted you for that. And I can't place something on someone. They've got to come alive in that. Verse 13 says, no, okay, now we're in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's read it. From 9 all the way down. It says, for our knowledge is fragmentary. And our prophecy is fragmentary. So we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Because what each person in this room knows is fragmentary. Every person, every person in this room has a small fragmented prophecy and knowledge. So we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. We can't rely on what one person says. We've got to rely on that through the Holy Spirit. I thought it was quite funny. It says love never fails and then it never fades. And in my Bible, someone messed water. It wasn't me. And the word fades is faded out. <laughs> Love never fails. It, it never fails. Love, love never fails. Um, 13 verse 8. Love is, is what enables us to be in union. It's what enables us to honor. Love is the, 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 the petrol, the, the power behind honor. The power behind unity. It, it's, it's that honoring what every single person has placed or what God has placed on every single person. And that love never fades. It never fails. We've got to ask, am I operating in love right now? Am I operating in love? Am I operating in God's love? Because if I am, I'm never going to fade in my honoring of the person that I love. I'm never going to fail in honoring the brethren in this church. I'm never going to fail in that. I'm going to come from a place of love every single time. Okay, so let's go back to verse 10. But when the complete and perfect comes, the imperfect will vanish away. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I'm done with those childish ways. I was listening to Henry Cloud again. Some people, when they were children, faced issues and problems that hurt them so much that they, they couldn't or can't deal with that pain. And what happens is they hide that part of their lives from God's love. They hide that part of their lives from other people's love too. They don't allow other people in. They don't allow God in. And then he says that when they do that, they get frozen in that area of their lives, even as they become adults. They stay children in that area of their lives unless they're able to open up in love with that area of their lives. Some people have been abused or had to become adults at the age of 12 because their parents have left them or, or a whole multitude of things that have gone wrong and, and when it's gone wrong, their response has to be to hide and close up love from entering into that space. And they stay there. They, they progress in other areas. They might be good accountants. They might be really good workers. But when it comes to relationships, they're frozen and stuck like a child in that area. Because for us to grow and grow out of being children, we need love to be acting on every area of our lives. We need love to be 
to be, love is the force that comes and acts and it takes us up and we grow up. You can only grow and become an adult in love. You can only grow and become perfect and mature according to what the Bible says in love. Some people are afraid of that word perfection and run away from it. Because they've never experienced it in love. Perfection has always been a requirement by someone saying, you must be and you shalt. What I'm saying is, church, we need to look at that perfection that God is calling us to. And if we have areas of failure, let's open up our heart so that God can come and love that part of our heart. Let's open up that part so someone else in the church can come and love you. But it needs to be opened up. There needs to be transparency, nothing hidden, so that we can grow up and no longer speak like children, no longer act like children in those areas. For now we're looking in a mirror that gives only a dim reflection of reality, but then when perfection comes, we will see in reality and we will see face to face. God says, when I present what is pure before you, man, you're going to see who you were created to be. You're going to see who God intended you, and you're going to absorb it with all of your heart. When the church realizes who they were created to be, when the bride sees herself, wow. No more hiding. And then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as God has fully and clearly understood me. Then I will know fully and clearly, even as God fully understands me. And so, faith, hope, and love abide. And I love just how the Amplified just breaks open. And we've already spoken about faith. Faith is conviction and belief, respecting man's relationship to God. Hope is joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. When we have honor, we are full of hope. Come on, I hope the best, and I expect the best. I am joyful, and I am confident. Hope brings joy and confidence. Anyone want to be confident in the room? Anyone want to be, have joy in the room? Anyone want insecurities to be washed away? Come on, it's hope that washes away insecurities. Love is true affection for God and man, growing out of God's love. Love is true affection, true affection, because of God's love. Amen? Cool, let's stand.